Welcome to the Virginia Commonwealth University Autism Center for Excellence webinar. Our topic today is drawing a blank, improving comprehension for readers on the autism spectrum. I'm Emily Island, and I'm pleased that you're joining us today for this webinar. Our purpose today is to answer two key questions, probably the two questions that caused you to tune in today for this webinar. Why do good readers on the autism spectrum have problems understanding? And what can we do about it? Two pressing issues that we need to address, and I hope our webinar today will do just that. I have a personal and a professional perspective on this topic. The first picture is my son, Tom, when he was three years old, uh, an interesting little guy who had stopped talking for six months when he was two. But by the time this picture was taken when he was three, he was talking again, but he could also read and spell, and we thought we had a genius on our hands. And of course, he is a very smart guy. The picture on the right is Tom graduating from California State University, Northridge, when he was 23 years old. And in the 20 years in between, lots of things happened, including Tom being do diagnosed with autism when he was 13. So I had a lot of challenges as a mother and became a professional advocate after I learned to help my own son, I started helping others. I went back to university to get a master's degree because I had two questions. Why does someone like Tom not understand what he reads and what can we do about it? And the interesting thing was that when I, at the university level, at the master's level, no one was really asking or answering those questions. So I went about uh, an independent study to learn what I could. And Drawing a Blank is the book that resulted uh, from that independent study. So what we hope to accomplish today is put more tools in your toolbox, because that's what you're looking for, how to help. But it's important to have a very full understanding of the issue, and then you can inform anything you do, any practices you choose, on the evidence of research findings, and then be most effective in the st using strategies and tools. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret right up front. There were 754 uh, reading intervention uh, studies uh, that were identified by Chang and Lin in um, 2007. And of those 754 studies about how to intervene with comprehension issues, only 11 included someone with autism. Some of the studies only had one person in them at all, and no studies had anyone with Asperger's. So when we try to use evidence-based practices, we, are, we have a very small evidence base to guide us. So the reason we talk a lot about what the problem is, how it relates to features of autism when someone who's a good reader doesn't understand, it's because you're going to have to find your own solutions. You're going to have to be as informed as possible so that you can make uh, informed decisions uh, about how you'd like to intervene because we really don't have that much research to go on. So our agenda to, to accomplish those goals is we're going to have a brief overview of reading, comprehension, and hyperlexia. And this is followed by understanding how the features of autism spectrum disorders affect comprehension. All of the features of autism affect comprehension. That might surprise you, but it's true. And then we have to identify skills that must be explicitly taught. There are a lot of studies that identify the reading comprehension breakdowns in this population, lots. So we know where the, where the pitfalls are, where the difficulties are, and that we can discuss as well. And then there's another uh, se session of this webinar, part two. And in that, in that part, we're going to talk about the five evidence-based interventions that have been identified and also talk about some promising strategies. But I hope that you'll tune in for both because they're quite complementary and uh, give you a, a full understanding of the issue. So let's start with what reading is. And it's important to get on the same page to define reading because different uh, reading tests define reading differently, and um, we have to know that we're all on the same page when we're uh, defining reading. So it's important to know that reading is a developmental process, and autism is a developmental disability. 
So there's your first clue to the nature of difficulties that people on the spectrum are going to have in developing literacy, which includes understanding. And in the photograph, we have the mom stimulating or the caregiver stimulating the little person on her lap and drawing his attention to the pictures and the words and the meaning. And even just looking at the picture, you know that this might be disrupted in young readers on the spectrum. But it, typically speaking, you see that cognitive development and environmental stimulation lead to the development of language skills, and those language skills lead to literacy. And that the process can be disrupted at any part of that uh, process um, over the years. The simple view of reading from Goff and Tumner is that reading is the product of decoding times comprehension. Someone can have a problem with decoding, comprehension, or both. If someone has a problem just with decoding, that's called dyslexia. And if someone has a problem just with comprehension, that's called hyperlexia. And that might be a different definition than hype of hyperlexia than, you're from, than you think of right away, which is precocious self-taught reading. But we're going to be using a different uh, definition of hyperlexia today. So hyperlexia is strong mechanical word recognition with comparatively poor comprehension. So that's the definition of hyperlexia we want to use. We want to focus on the fact that it's a superficial mechanical decoding without comprehension or with, with comparatively poor comprehension. And in fact, Grigorenko and others in a study in 2002 uh, recommended that we use the word hyperlexia exclusively with readers on the spectrum because it's so commonly related to um, the comprehension issue is so closely related to the features of autism that they wanted to use the term hyperlexia just for people on the autism spectrum who can decode well but have comparatively poor comprehension. And they suggest that we use the term reading comprehension disorder for someone who has a problem understanding but doesn't have autism. And that would be a, a, a much smaller subset of, of learners, according to these researchers. So another way of looking at hyperlexia is ASD minus C equals HPL, or autism spectrum disorders with less comprehension equals hyperlexia. And as we all know, hyperlexia looks like a gift. This child who taught himself to read, the child who does, doesn't seem to have any problem sounding out words, recognizing words, who reads fluently, perhaps with intonation, we think this is a gifted reader. However, if we really look closely, we can find that comprehension is missing from the earliest stages of this precocious reading or early um, success with decoding. And in fact, we can take it a step further and say that hyperlexia is a reading disability that requires intervention. And I wasn't sure about this, so I went and met Dr. Grigorenko and I asked her, am I interpreting your research correctly? Are you saying that hyperlexia is a reading disability just like dyslexia is a reading disability? And she said yes. So that's, that's kind of a new thought for many of us, that hyperlexia is actually a reading disability and that it requires intervention. It's not something that's just going to get better by itself. In fact, it could get worse if it's left unaddressed. As we all know, comprehension is the purpose and the essence of reading. Why bother reading if you're not going to get any value or message out of the material? But did you know that there are actually five types of reading comprehension? And all five types can be a challenge for readers on the spectrum. Literal comprehension, inferential, critical, effective, and lexical. And we're going to go ahead and, and see what each of those uh, entails. Literal comprehension is understanding the explicit material in the text. What color was the girl's dress? Yellow. You can find the answer or the meaning right in the material. Inferential, comp 
Inferential comprehension is understanding ideas beyond the literal text by interpreting, synthesizing, and extending meaning, going beyond the text. Critical comprehension is meaning derived by evaluating, analyzing, and making judgments about the material that was read. Effective comprehension is relating to the material at a personal and emotional level. In the picture, you can see the man responding emotionally to something that he's reading that's really pleasing him. And lexical comprehension is making sense of the text because you know the meaning of the key vocabulary words. So it's important to assess and address all five kinds of reading comprehension. And this is when it's important to look at the test manuals when you're testing to find out how they define comprehension and the types of comprehension that they're measuring. Uh, I am quite positive from having read uh, the manual for a very um, commonly used reading comprehension test that they don't think that it's important to know the author's intention or to infer meaning. Uh, that's not what they're testing. So if that's what you're trying to test, be sure you read the manual to make sure that you have a, um, a testing tool that works for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about assessment in a few minutes. Now let's look at the National Reading Panel definition of reading. They consider it a form of dynamic thinking that includes interpreting information through the filter of one's own knowledge and beliefs, using the author's organizational plan to think about the information or impose order on a disorganized writer, and finally inferring what the author does, doesn't tell explicitly, as well as many other cognitive actions. So the National Reading Panel is saying that reading is a dynamic thinking process and um, it, it involves interpreting, organizing, and inferring. So if we think about people on the spectrum, we may find that the lower order thinking skills are intact in terms of being able to understand concrete things and remember facts. So the lower, lower order um, comprehension in autism may be intact. But where it gets more difficult is the higher order thinking skills where we ask the reader to evaluate, create new or personal meaning, apply the meaning of what was read, or analyze it. So we know that these will be areas of difficulty for readers on the spectrum. And therefore, in drawing a blank, I, I came up with this premise. It's a primary premise of this book that the demands of the dynamic reading process present a mismatch with the cognitive skills and core deficit areas often seen in ASD and therefore are at the root of the comprehension problems. So we have to understand that the features of autism are closely tied to the types of reading comprehension difficulties that these students will have. And is part of our understanding when we search for solutions, strategies, and tools. Now in primary grades, the comprehension uh, problem can be masked. Why? Because of the strong decoding skills, the good memory, getting the facts right, and understanding the concrete content. So that's why these students up to third grade sail right through if you're only looking at the things we look for at that age. Can they decode? Do they remember? Did they get the facts? That's what we're looking for in those early grades. And uh, the comprehension issue may be masked by a superficial retelling. If we don't ask the student to go into a more meaningful retelling of what happened in the story, they may remember enough facts to get by. But really, if we go deeper, uh, we might find that they're already having difficulties with comprehension. Now, what happens to these students is the problems can worsen over time, especially around fourth grade when you move from learning to read to reading to learn. Well, these many of these students came to school knowing how to read. And then at fourth grade, they kind of get stuck because now they need to use a whole different set of skills. 
So, it's, and the material itself changes of fourth grade. Uh, you, you get into the more expository material like social studies that might be unfamiliar. Uh, the, the content does become increasingly complex from about fourth grade on uh, and more abstract. And that's when students begin to read novels and poetry. And another thing is that the material often goes beyond the person's own experience or personal knowledge base and therefore is more difficult and unfamiliar. So around age 10, many readers on the spectrum begin to struggle whether or not it's recognized. There are symptoms and signs that they're struggling. Uh, Nation, Clark, Wright, and Williams did a study in 2006 in which they looked at 41 10-year-olds on the spectrum around fourth or fifth grade. And they found that compared to their peers, 65% of the readers on the spectrum had poor comprehension of a full standard deviation when in, in every other way they were comparable to their peers. 38% had severe impairments of two standard deviations or more compared to their peers. Yet these were people who were decoding fluently. And thirdly, they found that these readers on the spectrum had personal internal gaps of up to two standard deviations between their own decoding skills and their own ability to understand. So this is a big red flag, that internal discrepancy. And what they also found uh, in Nation and Norbury's study in 2005 was that if you spend less time reading because you're finding it difficult, you have a weaker vocabulary. And if you have a weaker vocabulary, you understand less, so you don't want to read. And it's like the Matthew effect, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Good readers improve their vocabulary, improve their comprehension, and, and drink up reading enthusiastically. But struggling readers don't want to read, and that further depresses their vocabulary and then makes reading less enjoyable and less fruitful. So that's our, our poor comprehender cycle, and that happens to a lot of readers on the spectrum around age 10 when we ask them to read anything that's not in their area of interest. So the profile of hyperlexia, uh, do you know this student who's on the high functioning end of the spectrum with an average or above average IQ who may not have their comprehension problem even identified yet is in general ed most of the day, is testing average on standardized tests, and testing in the uh, average range on acceptive and expressive vocabulary tests. This is our reader with hyperlexia. This is what they look like in your schools or maybe at your house. But the hidden profile is that these readers are actually frustrated by grade level material. They do better at school because there's more structure and support to get the work done, and they struggle more at home, uh, and, and homework could take hours, and this is a, a, one of the red flags for hyperlexia. Someone who had ease in school and suddenly is struggling. Uh, they have difficulty with those higher level interpretations and understanding, and finally, it's important to know that this problem that they're experiencing with written language, they may also be experiencing with auditory language, which puts them at a double disadvantage. So maybe they didn't understand what they read, but they also didn't understand it when the teacher explained. So maybe these are people that you know, especially if we start looking in, from a new perspective. We want to say that readers on the spectrum are at risk because of the features of the disorder. They are at risk for reading comprehension failure they are likely to be missing foundational prerequisite skills. For example, they may not be able to recognize cause and effect or separate relevant from irrelevant. And if you can't do that, you can't find the main idea. So when these types of foundational prerequisite skills are missing, then they can't go on to use other strategies that depend on those skills, like summarization. And therefore, uh, th these readers have a very unique profile of reasons that they struggle and um, the needs they have in terms of intervention. So let's look at why these are unique readers and, and why we need to really get on board with addressing their multiple needs. 
We need to know why people have difficulty so we know how to help them and what they need to learn, what we need to teach. Now there are two um, main categories in the diagnostic manual for autism spectrum disorders. The first one is persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction that will have direct effects on reading comprehension. And oddly enough, believe it or not, the restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities in autism also affect reading comprehension. So we're going to take a look at that. There are three features in the category of social communication and social interaction. A deficit in social reciprocity, not understanding back and forth relationships. A deficit in nonverbal communication, that is the use and reading of nonverbal cues like facial expression, body language, and other cues. And the third is deficits with relationships, not knowing how to form and maintain friendships and not understanding relationships. How are these going to affect reading comprehension? Well, let's look at it. Some of the social communication features are going to affect literal and lexical comprehension. For example, uh, when we read to young readers, they're supposed to increase their cognitive development, their learning and literacy, yet this process might be um, disrupted in a, a reader with autism who just wants to read by himself and read the same thing over and over. So uh, maybe our young readers on the spectrum have vocabulary gaps and, and don't know what words mean, certain words mean, because they, um, this part of their development was disrupted due to their lack of social reciprocity and social connection uh, to their um, parent or caregiver. And typical children develop wonderful conversational skills, vocabulary, and concept of development through shared literacy and shared reading when they're younger. And then children on the spectrum who still are exposed to these things but don't benefit in the same way would then have depressed vocabulary, less concept development. And we think that, that that's exactly what's happening. Uh, not understanding relationships, well, that could affect them in their affective uh, comprehension and their critical comprehension. They might have problems relating to the characters or the situations that the characters are in. They can miss cues from real life about what's going on and then they don't get those context cues and clues that we all respond to in the text to, to follow the story and understand the characters. And as a matter of fact, because of the problems with social relationships, readers on the spectrum might find narratives harder than expository material because they're not relating to the characters the same way. And if someone has problem with nonverbal cues, that can affect their inferential and their effective comprehension. They're not recognizing the nonverbal cues that they read and inferring what it means if mother stood with her hands on her hips and her mouth was in a straight line. If they don't know what that means in real life, then maybe they're not going to recognize it in literature either. So then that affects their understanding of the characters, the action, whether someone uh, the, is, is being deceitful and the author cues us to that bad intention of the person with the nonverbal description. Uh, they may not also understand what the author intends. Is the author joking here? Does the author like this character? These things matter to us when we read and this can be lost on many readers on the spectrum. Another way that the social communication features of autism can affect reading comprehension is theory of mind. That's all about perspective taking and it affects effective and critical comprehension at a minimum. They don't recognize deceit and lies, so they take everything at face value when they're reading and then they lose the thread of the plot or the meaning. They don't understand character's motivation. Why did she do that? Why did she say that? Why is she crying? They, they may not be following the, the feelings and thoughts of the character because of problems with theory of mind. And again, the author's view and intention, and the example I like to give is um, 
Jonathan Swift's modest proposal that we all had to read in high school where he says that the solution to the Irish famine is having poor Irish people eat their babies. Well, he doesn't mean that literally. He means it to shame the British government for not doing more to help the poor Irish during the famine. Um, but if you don't know what the uh, author intends, if you take it literally, you would be completely horrified. The notion itself is horrifying, except we know to interpret it as political satire. So um, the author's intention is very important to a reader, and uh, many people with autism would, would miss that, and it would be quite relevant that they do. Now let's look at the restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, and activities, and how that would affect somebody's reading comprehension. We know that this, this uh, category includes repetitive motor map. We know that this category includes repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech. It includes insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, or ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behavior. It includes highly restricted fixated interests with abnormal intensity or focus. And it includes the hypo or high hyper reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. All of these things can affect reading comprehension. So when someone has restrictive and repetitive behavior and interest, it usually means that they're more focused on objects than people. Very important because most children learn by focusing on people, not objects. So when you have a focus on objects over people, it's going to restrict what you know about people and the world. And what happens is people on the spectrum become specialists in a generalist world which means they have limited general knowledge. And I like to say that many readers on the spectrum have poverty of experience, not that they're not exposed to all different things, but because of their own restrictive interest, they may not be paying attention when we're trying to expose them to other things. So therefore, they have less world knowledge to, as a foundation to relate to new material. Also, this explains why these learners may be very literal and concrete in their understanding and stay at that level in Bloom's taxonomy because they're having trouble going beyond their own experience uh, and, and uh, understanding things that are imaginative. And of course, they're going to have trouble with visualization like images and imagery. Picture this. Well, maybe they can't picture it. I, I, I remember talking with Temple Grandin and she was explaining that when she reads and sees the words tree, the word tree, she pulls up a tree in her, from her file box and she pulls up a Christmas tree. And then she keeps reading and she sees the word leaves. So she puts the Christmas tree image back in the box and pulls up a tree with leaves. And she keeps reading and she says the leaves were golden. So she puts down her green leaf image and pulls up a golden tree. And so she's not using According to that description, she's not using the words and the text to create a visual image. She's doing a matching game with the images she already has stored. So that kind of gives us a good idea of how difficult it is for people to visualize based on the text. And then, of course, if they're not creating a visual image, how can they then verbalize back to us uh, what they read, what it was, and give us relevant information because they didn't store an image. And Tom, my son, he said to me, Mom, if it hasn't happened to me, my mind is a blank page. He was trying to write uh, an imaginative story when he was in eighth grade, and he just couldn't come up with anything. And no matter how hard we tried, after a long struggle, he said, if it hasn't happened to me, my mind is a blank page. And that really gives us excellent insight into the idea of how concrete and literal and experience-based the person's understanding may be and the, and the lack of ability to imagine what the author is describing is a real disadvantage. And we also talk about the cognitive profile of autism, uh, including problems with central coherence, which means getting the big picture. And that affects critical and effective comprehension at a minimum. 
So we see people who have bottom-up processing, they're focused on the details. I had a student with autism in one of my classes who told me, I feel like I'm standing too close to an Impressionist painting and all I see is the dots. That's really insightful. They have difficulty separating relevant and irrelevant information. A woman with autism once said, when I read, it's like highlighting everything in gray. So if you're highlighting everything in gray, what are you going to remember? Nothing or some fact, but not necessarily the main idea or the most important information. And also problems with synthesis, integrating the parts into the whole. So those are things that they may have difficulty with. Getting the point, creating the gist, what does this mean to me? That could be a real challenge for readers on the spectrum. We also know readers on the spectrum have impaired executive function. And they can be disorganized readers. They can lose focus. They don't know what to pay attention to or how to shift attention from one thing to the next. They may be impulsive readers and go too fast. And they may not plan well when they read because reading is actually a very organized process, which many of us take for granted how well our brains are able to integrate all the activities we need to do to be organized readers. So, I hope you'll agree that due to the features of autism and other aspects of the cognitive profile, all the types of reading comprehension will challenge people on, on the spectrum. Literal, inferential, critical, effective, and lexical. And if you're wondering where those five types came from, I was wanted to do some assessment of reading comprehension, and I went to the textbook by Salvia and Isseldyke on how to assess. And they said, well, you know, there really aren't that many good standardized tests for reading comprehension. If you want to get to the bottom of it, be sure you test these five, these five types. If you want to get to the bottom of reading comprehension issues, be sure to test all five types of comprehension, whatever tools you may use. And maybe they're not going to be formal standardized tests. Maybe there's going to be other better ways to assess. Now on page uh, 56 to 57 of Drawing a Blank, you'll find 43 skills that need to be explicitly taught. Based on the research on these readers, understanding their cognitive profile and the features of the disorder, 43 different areas of breakdown and comprehension have been identified. They fall into three categories. Basic foundational skills, language-based skills, and active higher order thinking skills. Isn't that logical that the breakdown would occur in those three areas? So let me give you some examples. In the basic area, we've referred to finding the main idea and understanding cause and effect and prediction. Those are three basic skills that everybody needs to know, yet are often disordered in readers on the spectrum. Language-based skills would, be, would include multiple meanings of word. Like, for example, my son loves Star Wars, so his meaning for force has to do with, with may the force be with you. And force open the door might not be part of his lexicon. So he wouldn't understand that force has two meanings, and he would try to use the Star Wars definition when he reads about forcing open the door. We know that people on the spectrum have problems categorizing objects by concepts. So if you, you know, that's something you need to do when you're reading. You need to be sorting and categorizing and using context clues. And these language-based skills can be identified through language testing and speech and language pathologists and others can help with this language development to improve comprehension. And finally, in the area of higher order thinking skills, synthesizing, grabbing all the relevant pieces and and, and coming up with a conclusion, that would be a big challenge for readers with hyperlexia. Analyzing the characters, it's easy for many and so hard for readers on the spectrum. And using comprehension strategies while reading, that's something that they've discovered is that people with autism are not self-monitoring, not realizing their comprehension breaks down, so then they can't repair while reading. What a huge disadvantage that is. And those are just nine of the 43 areas of breakdown, just to give you an, exam an idea. And I think you can infer what the rest of them are. E pretty much every skill that's needed to read and understand is 
probably, you know, we have to make, make sure they're all there and there's a big chance that they're not. So, so for example, how do we teach prediction in kindergarten? The teacher reads a story and says to the kids, what do you think will happen next? And all the children get excited and they raise their hand and they shout out their answers and most of them are pretty good predictions. And then there's a little person on the rug who has autism and he either doesn't answer at all or says some off the wall comment. And that's how prediction is handled in kindergarten. In kindergarten, we are asking children to predict who know how to predict. And if a child doesn't know how to predict, that exercise doesn't teach them to predict. So in other words, we're asking in many ways, for example, giving someone a passage to read and then giving them comprehension questions doesn't teach them to comprehend. It tests whether they did or didn't, but it is not an instructional method. So many things that we're doing in schools are not actually instructional methods. It doesn't teach the child to look for context clues or, or have a way of predicting. So I like to say, go back to the kindergarten standards and see what comprehension strategies were taught and use it as an inventory. Even for someone who's 10 or 20 years old, go back and use an inventory of the state standards for comprehension, starting with kindergarten to be sure that they were actually learned. Because a child who leaves kindergarten without knowing how to predict is a child in fifth grade who still doesn't know how to predict because it's not ever taught explicitly. So to be successful readers and gain meaning when reading, exposure to the curriculum is often not enough. These students were exposed. They are likely to need explicit instruction and individualized intervention to support growth and development of, spe spe of specific essential skills. To be successful readers and gain meaning when reading, exposure to the curriculum is not enough. Students with hyperlexia are likely to need explicit instruction and individualized intervention to support the growth and development of specific essential skills. That's the bottom line. Here's a, a little graphic that will help you get some ideas about how to assess what tools could be useful. And we have a whole chapter on this in Drawing a Blank, and these are some of the examples uh, from our appendix, uh, tests that some of the researchers use that really got down to the bottom of things, tests that speech and language pathologists can use that can get to the bottom of the difficulties, and even some things that actually were able to uh, reveal my son's reading comprehension failure at the age of 14. It's just how long it took us to get there. <clears throat> so, I hope you agree with our conclusion that our readers on the spectrum with hyperlexia have multiple complex needs. They have skill gaps that you wouldn't expect to see given their ability to decode. They may get limited benefit from learning about reading comprehension in the classroom, and therefore they require explicit instruction and they will also need help with writing. When those blank papers come back, it's not because the person doesn't know how to write. It's because they didn't understand what they read and they can't retell or give you uh, uh, information or interpret and analyze. So that's why these papers start coming back blank or with very superficial writing. So it all ties together, doesn't it? So we have finished our agenda for part one of this webinar. We have had a brief overview of reading. We've looked at what comprehension is and redefined hyperlexia. We understand how the features of autism spectrum disorder affect comprehension. And we've looked at some of the skills that must be explicitly taught. In the next part, in drawing a blank part two, we're gonna look at the five uh, evidence-based practices and some other promising practices. And I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this. I hope you'll check out Drawing a Blank for more information. And also my new project is called Be Safe, the Movie, in which I have integrated all kinds of reading comprehension and comprehension supports to teach our young people with autism and related disabilities how to interact safely with the police, a very, very important topic that everybody needs to understand. Thank you so much.